Welcome, low ego action heroes. This is Debbie Levitt from Delta CX. We're a full service CX and UX consultancy. You should know that. And welcome to episode 10 of our Monday stream, Think Out Loud. And every Monday, well, we try to take a look at a project you have sent in, sometimes real, sometimes fake, and take a look at how would we approach this project if it were real so that we can help people learn that giant Grand Canyon between here's a thing and now how the heck do we design or research this? Because I find that most education doesn't tell you that middle part and we're not helping anybody there. So the show is live and we absolutely welcome people's questions and comments as we go. I'm going to introduce our project today and then I'm going to introduce some special guests who are joining us to work on it. Hello, Abby. And this project project came from uh, Sirocco. I, call, I pronounce her Sirocco. I give her an Italian pronunciation, but I believe she says Sirocco. Hi, Madalina. Actually, because my screen is going to give away who our guests are, I will just quickly bring them in so that they can introduce themselves and then we will uh, explain the project. Look who it is, everybody. It's some of the <laughs> show favorites, Larry Marine and Stephanie Walter. So, uh, Larry, tell us who the heck you are. I'm Larry Marine. Uh, a lot of you probably uh, read my stuff on LinkedIn, but I am a student and acolyte of Dr. Don Norman. I was fortunate enough to have him as my professor, and he taught me a task-oriented uh, method of design, and that's what I try to promote. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that today. Sounds good. Steph, who are you? Yeah, I'm Stephanie Walter, S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E, -E, Walter, W-A-L-T-E-R. Uh, I'm a UX designer and researcher. I've been working for 12 years now for a lot of industries, including travel industry. <laughs> so this is why I'm here tonight. <laughs> Super, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to flip over to our browser where we've got some stuff queued up for this particular project. And again, this was sent in by um, Sirocco. If you would like to send something in, go to deltacx.com slash links, and there will be all kinds of links there related to the show, like joining our Slack universe and uh, getting coaching from me and seeing our calendar of events. It's all there. Um, okay, so let me press the button that should uh, queue up. Okay, good. So there's me and the tip jar and Larry and Stephanie and my browser. Okay, so what we got in the post uh, was, let's say, okay, so the, the idea came from Stephanie's LinkedIn post, and I've opened up the link, which we'll look at uh, quickly. Baymar did a study on travel accommodations. Hi, Miguel. But what really intrigued me was Larry's comment underneath. He said, these sites tend to be little more than digital brochures. And then Sirocco says, they aren't task related <laughs> at all. OMG, brain explosion, still processing. What would it look like if they were task related? So let's say the audience is someone who's unfamiliar with a city they're traveling to. Maybe they're traveling as a group of four people. They want connecting rooms or rooms that are close to each other. They don't know what area is best or what the public transportation looks like. Assume the users haven't done much research on this target destination. They're going to whatever is our website first. And let's assume the site is some sort of online travel uh, agency. Um, here's some key problems that we're going to try to talk about and possibly design for. How do they pay for the accommodations as a group? How do they get to the hotel from the airport? Can they request an early or late check-in or check-out? Can they book rooms that are close together or connecting? What's the best area for them to stay in? How does the public transportation even work in this city? Do they need a pass? Where do they get it? How far is the uh, mass transit from the hotel? So these definitely sound like some good typical questions that a traveler might ask. Now, at this point of the show, we usually flip over to our research screen and we talk about just generally, what type of research would we do before designing something like this? Larry, Steph, is that okay with you if we think about that a little bit first? Yeah, sure. sure. Always start with research. That's right. <laughs> okay. So let me flip over to Aksher. And I have a little page. And by the way, if anybody wants to see this later, you can uh, load it up in your browser through Aksher Share. And so it is, uh, this is letter L. 
Q, X, X, P as in Peter, Z as in zebra or zebra, depending upon where you're located, dot Axshare, A-X-S-H-A-R-E dot com. And you'll be able to see all of the pages we're working on today. I will load them up at the end. So right now they, they're not going to be synchronized. So you can uh, check it out later if you're watching uh, this later. We're going to keep that one up. Okay, let's talk about some generative research that we would want to do. Larry, Steph, yell something out. What would we? What are some of the goals of this research? What do we want to learn? Basically, we want to learn what is the entirety of the travel um, objective. Why are they going somewhere? What are, what are they going to need? So, uh, let's you know not just focus on getting a room at a hotel because. People don't travel just to get a room at a hotel. There's something else going on. Let's yeah. try to understand what what their mindset is. What all what are all the things they need to keep in you know keep track of and think about. Okay, so why are they going somewhere, and what is the entirety of the travel objective? And by that, do you mean like that kind of end to end journey? Yeah, and sometimes even before that. You know, oh. for instance, if you're traveling uh, internationally, what are the uh, uh, visa requirements, et cetera, et cetera, that you have to do before you even take the tri take the trip? Oh yeah, can you even travel? <laughs> yeah, right, right now that's a great that's question. A question. Okay, like nowadays. visa shots and stuff like that. This is important. Right. Like um, right. before the pandemic, you know, some areas you need specific shots and. Also, I think some area in, in depending where I come from, you need uh, a minimum amount of money on your account, which I think mm -hmm. is really, really horrible. But it's basically to say, yeah, if uh, we are sure you gave, you will go back or something like that. So, mm. Got it. So now yeah. these are a lot of the things that our travelers will have to think about. But now we're thinking about research goals. So it sounds like we would mm. be observing um, some of their research or booking process and maybe, Larry, yeah. Steph, help me out here. I mean, I'm not sure I would ask them. <laughs> no, you're, you're well, I'm, I'm, well, I'm look, I, I can't well, see you, so I'm just asking you to speak up and interrupt me if you want to. Um, yeah. What about, I mean, What they might did is, uh, yeah, what they might did, I think, uh, they did this research where they basically like did some observational study from what I understand. So they asked them to think aloud and they ask, they observed them while they were uh, booking and then they built this super big report. So I would buy the, the Weimar report first just to see what's in there because I would be curious. But yeah, then I would be, be doing my own research as well. Okay, got it. And then... Um... But Larry, help me out here for a moment, because I'm gonna I'm gonna pretend I'm the research newbie, so that uh, you know the, all the newbies who are watching will be like, I'm thinking what Deb's thinking. So I'm the research newbie. <laughs> I'm not gonna get these people into a, an observational session or an interview and say, Do you know about visa requirements? How am I going to <laughs> learn these things without asking them directly? Well, you know, you don't always have to ask them. You could always do some of the research yourself as if you were the traveler uh, and mm. do, you know, Google what are the uh, uh, travel requirements to go to Italy, for instance. Well, not for you, Debbie, but, you know, for me, uh, what would be the travel requirements? So I could do some research on my own as if I'm the traveler to understand what are all of the things that I need to know about traveling um, to a certain location, to a city. Um, but you can ask things uh, of people like, what was the last trip that you took with more than one person, with more than yourself? What was it for? Who did you go with? <laughs> you know, things like that. So reflect on past experiences because people can remember that. And so you might even be able to ask them, what did you wish you knew before you went on that last trip that you know now? Things like that. So get a sense of what they didn't know but needed to. That's right. That yeah, kind of understanding. 
And then standing mental model and expectation at some point. Also, right, I wonder so, if but, budget. Uh, yeah, sorry, oh, go ahead. Budget, yeah. But, you know, talking about mental models and expectations, you, you can gather that before an event, right? And kind of reflect it based on their past experiences. But when you're asking mm -hmm. about a past travel thing, you know, asking what their expectations were after the fact, um, it's going to change. But if you can ask what their expectations are before an event, you're going to get a much more realistic answer. Now, both of those answers or both of those questions will um, produce good answers. You just have to understand, you know, where they're coming from. If you ask about expectations mm -hmm. of a past event, you're going to hear expectations after the event. If you're asking about expectations for an upcoming event, their expectations are going to be different because say they've never gone to New York City, but they've traveled before. Their expectations about New York City will be incomplete based on, say they went to Cincinnati before. There are very different cities, very different expectations. So uh, just be aware of what you're asking and what the timeline is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I always like to remind people that some of these, how often do you do a thing questions might be okay for a screener survey where we're trying to specifically find people who do things often or sometimes or rarely, but I usually don't include those in the interviews because I feel like they don't help me with the UX strategy or prioritization or, or designing. Larry, what do you think, or Steph, what do you think about some of those quantity or frequency questions that people sometimes ask in interviews? Mm, I think you're sometimes right. I think good screener questions. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Stephanie. Steph? Yeah. Uh, yeah, sometimes, uh, you know, some people ask how often to have an open question so that because if you have someone, do you do something? Yes or no? You may have mm. a pretty. Um, so if you ask how often they could say, ah, uh, I don't do it, but I was. or So you might have a kind of more open answer. But yeah, it's um, <laughs> most of the time uh, I put those. I, I did put that in a screener question to my last uh, survey which was anyone who said, uh, I don't use that, like zero often, then they don't get the rest of the survey or something like that. Right, so yeah. A, a so yeah. To... yeah, you can use those questions to screen people, but when you are interviewing them, I like to ask, when was the last time? What was that like? When is going to be the next time that you're gonna do X? Okay, it got depends it. On the, yeah. Yeah, and then for our participant profile, what, um, how many people would you tend to want to uh, observe or research? And I don't know, we don't even know how many buckets or types of people there are here. <laughs> well, you've got basically three groups in any population. You've got people who've never done something, you've got people who've done it a bit, and then you have people who do it a lot. So you have novice, average, and expert. And who are you going after on this? Is this going to be the average traveler, somebody who travels mm -hmm. once or twice a year? Uh, is this going to be a business travel traveler who travels, you know, once a month? Or, or is this going to be a first-time traveler? Um, I think for the majority of the users, you're going to find the average. You know, uh, they travel once or twice a year um, as a, a, a good starting point. So, but it depends on what the product is and what the project uh, scope is. Sure, of course. This isn't a, yeah, nobody watching this should think that it's a hard and fast rule that you always find <laughs> novices, average, and expert. There there might be different buckets and types for whatever you're doing. Sometimes I find the, the uh, if we don't already know, some good natural buckets are low effort, medium effort, high effort. People who are like, oh my God, I'm going to research for weeks before I book travel and, and people who mm -hmm. are lower effort. Sometimes I break them at that way. So, um, so if we yeah. thought we wanted to we used to, yeah, go ahead, Steph. Yeah. We also used to have like, uh, are those people traveling for business or leisure? 
but this is when I was working for the travel industry because it changed a lot. We like business. They don't really care that much about the budget because the company will be reimbursed, but still it needs to, they can't take a super fancy hotel uh, that will be super high level, high class. Otherwise it will be hard to justify. So, but I think that expert goes into business as well. So you could have a kind of a, a crossing between the buckets. That makes sense. And yeah, good to point out that very often for the business traveler, yes, the company pays for it, but there might be strict policies about how mm -hmm. much they can spend, where they can be located, what brands they they use. So um, that's an interesting point also. So obviously you have to think about this when you are planning your research. Um, so ultimately mm -hmm. in something like this, maybe Larry or Steph, how many people do you think you would want to try to observe to have enough information to start to make some good conclusions or find some insights and opportunities? Well, the general rule of thumb is, you know, eight to 12 people per segment as you have mm. there. But I find that yeah. I'm uh, usually pretty good if, if I can determine what representative users look like, uh, maybe, five or six per segment but that's me that's because mm. i've been doing this for 30 years yeah i was gonna say you're you're a little bit on another level <laughs> than the you know some of the audience here so um and uh so maybe eight to 12 for these buckets and then you know but, but remember everybody if you have novice average and expert and you have business and personal now you start to have permutations and combinations, <laughs> you know, you can yeah. have the newbie business traveler and the whatever. So sometimes you end up with, you might feel like you have uh, six buckets of people, eight typologies. Um, hypothetically, you would want to try to meet eight to 12 of them, or maybe at least six for all of these yeah, buckets if you are trying to do a more complete study with that good group of people. Steph, you were saying? And yeah, oh, sorry. Sessions, Usually maybe? the idea is, it's hard to plan for that, but the idea is uh, as many people as uh, until you don't feel like you're learning something new, you know, when you have this feeling, like, I, I tend to have this feeling in Enterprise UX where we, we usually try to reach at least 12 people and we will schedule for 15 because some people will not show up or something like that. But usually, yeah, I tend to agree with Larry after seven, eight person, if you've done your buckets, let's call them buckets for today, <laughs> properly upfront, you're starting to hear the same things and again and again, which is great because then you know you're on the right track. But uh, yeah, until you don't learn anything new is also <laughs> quite interesting. You know, okay. and you also don't have to do all of the interviews and observations all at once. You can start with a group of about, you know, eight to 12, learn a few things and then start to refine what you would call your buckets. And then you can start uh, recruiting and interviewing people. And you may find that your buckets aren't what you thought they were. So you can stagger your, your research. So you're not having to do, um, you know, 50 uh, interviews right away. Yeah, that's a really great point. I do find that sometimes who the marketing department thinks are the segments or the buckets are different than who than what UX sees because marketing tends to see <laughs> demographics. And it sounds like Stephanie has something to add. Marketing tends to see demographics and UX tends to group people more by behavior than by age or job uh, type. You know, like where I'm consulting right now, uh, sometimes the people are treating the tech worker different than the blue collar worker. And my thought is, but what if they have the same task and the same process, just different jobs? Yeah, exactly. Right. No, I'm just happy to not to have, I'm just happy not to not to have to deal with marketing at the moment. Right, because you're because, enterprise yeah. and you're internal, an so, internal tool. I have 100 problems, but marketing is not one of them. Very good. <laughs> I, I hear a rap song coming. Um, okay, so uh, this is probably an okay, really high level kind of research idea. Um, and just to give people an idea of where we start and how we think about it and some of the decisions we make when when considering research. Um, we've got some people watching live. I see at least nine people. 
on YouTube right now. Anybody have any questions about some of what we're saying here with the research? Anything you're not sure of why we did? Anything you would do and you're wondering if it's right or wrong? I know we've got about a 30 second delay today, so I'm just going to yap and, and kill the time a little bit while we see if anybody has a question to add. I can't see how many people are joining from LinkedIn today. I only get YouTube numbers in my system. So um, wh whatever system you're in, please uh, ask a question about the research part if you have it. And then we'll go back to the article that Stephanie originally posted. We'll skim through it quickly and we'll, we'll take a couple of high level notes from it. So let's see if there's any questions. I will um, flip over to the article while we wait for some questions. So the original article that Steph had posted to LinkedIn was um, this article, which you should be able to Google for. It's uh, Baymard Institute. And uh, you can see from the slug, it was new research travel accommodations. And it looks like this was um, after 992 hours of testing various <laughs> travel accommodation sites. You know, what, what were some of the key takeaways? Gosh. I know. Who did that? That took some um, time. Oh, Madalena has a question. Why did you choose generative research as opposed to other types of research? Uh, who wants to answer why we are doing generative research and not just evaluating the current site? Softball thrown at Larry. <laughs> <laughs> That's my bailiwick. That's what I like to, I talk, to talk about. So... Um, the reason is, if you just do evaluative research, you're taking, um, you're assuming that the current site is solving the right problem. Um, and you should always start your research with making sure that you know what problem um, you're trying to approach, trying to solve. And so if you do generative research, you find that this is just a, you know, typical digital brochure of this is these are the hotels you can use. These are the dates that are available. You figure it out. And what you find is people have different problems than just trying to book a room. And so the generative research helps broaden your understanding of the problem domain. Right, rather than just trying to evaluate the current site, which sometimes leads to, say it along with me, Larry, incremental, incremental yeah. changes rather than the rethinking these things usually need. Right, and all you end up doing is polishing a turd. Yeah. Steph? Yeah, that's the thing. In, in those industries, everyone is copying everyone. So we already have enough <laughs> of the whole... Uh, copying and building on top of someone else. So, yeah. And it looks like they got their data from 992 hours spent in 317 usability sessions. So in that sense, it sounds like it was evaluative, remote moderated mm -hmm. testing of various travel websites, um, both the big aggregators, brands, boutique hotels, and, uh, property rental. So let me see if I can scroll down to some of the things that they are suggesting. So one thing that they mentioned here was that they noticed that uh, when people got to some of these search results, they didn't always notice that there was a map view. So up here, it does say map view, yeah. but that in some cases people didn't notice it and they would copy paste the address and open up another window and put it into Google or Google Maps because they didn't notice the map view. Um, that was one thing that they noticed. So you have to ask yourself though, why do people need to see it on a map? What are they looking mm. for on the map? It could yeah, be so many I things. Would go Step. I would go one step further, which is uh, maybe they will still need uh, Google Maps. Maybe they have uh, some pinpoints. If you think about, okay, I want to visit that and that and that. And often, as when you travel, you end up checking where the hotel is on Google Maps because it's kind of the only way to know where how close it is to everything you want to visit. Or if you travel for business, for instance, how close it is to the office of your client. So even here, like, I'm not sure the view map would solve um, every um, single problem because you would get the website uh, map. It can be a Google map. It can be something else. But you might still need to have your own map on the, the right with your own reference points. 
So this is right. So how the current the, situation would not solve it. Right. And so when we think about knowledge design, I'm, I was waiting to get into this. So when we think about knowledge design, you just said the keywords. People need to know where something is in mm. proximity of a, a target, which is getting back to looking at the entirety of the travel objective. People are going somewhere for a reason. Can you capture that reason and give them insight into things like, well, if you want to go to this place, you know, um, there's no place to park. So you don't want a rental car, or, you know, things like that. So there's a lot of detail that the traveler who's never been to, say, New York City might not know that you don't want to rent a car. Um, and that all of the places they might want to visit are within walking mm -hmm. distance or that Uber is very popular in New York City. You know, it's more than just getting a hotel room. It's the whole travel objective. So the system should be providing, you know, asking questions. What do you want to do in New York City? Do you want to go to the Guggenheim? Do you want to go to here? Do you want to go to there? Do you want to go to this mm -hmm. restaurant? You want to go to see this play? Well, all of those are easily reached by the Hilton on 54th Avenue. Yeah. So, you know, um, by asking this the is users what's... questions, mm -hmm. then you're getting their objective. And then you can promote more than just a map. Because if you've never been to the city, the map isn't going to help you. Because New York City, it looks like, oh, everything's right there. But boy, if you go from uptown to Central Park, <laughs> that's a long walk. I was just going to say that. I... <laughs> where, where were you? I was. Uh, I went to Google I.O. I was like, yeah, I'm super close. Oh, boy, 45 minutes walk. It was nice, but I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah, and, and is the walking flat or is it hilly? You know, not everybody no, can walk hills. It was flat. Right, but think San Francisco yeah. now, you know, yeah, yeah sure, all nope. you have to do is walk up <laughs> California. Well, that's straight up. That is like a no slope, you know, line. Nope. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think that even though some hotels, Larry, I would say try to semi-solve this, when you get to their detail pages, very often it says like 0. 0.3 mm -hmm. miles to this and 0. 0.6 miles to that. But I always wonder, like, I don't really have a sense of what I'm walking to or or through and I told the story recently where I was staying in uh um Montreal because I was uh training the CBC on Axure plug plug um some years ago <laughs> and I thought I was the most clever woman alive because I was like yeah hey I can get a hotel that's like a half a mile from where I need to be I'll walk a half a mile each day it'll be nice and healthy and then right before I was about to leave they had like 14 inches of snow <laughs> and nope. now the idea of walking a half a mile each way in, you know, what's that, 30 centimeters of snow and it coming down and it was freezing out. And so I had like, I quickly ordered these galoshes on Amazon and I had to bring them and, you know, like you, you best laid plans, you know, like you, you think you want to walk something and then you get there and you kind of don't. Um, yeah. Oh, oh Sirocco is saying, hey, parking, the walk, the incline of the walk. I never even considered those things. I would love to know that before going to a place. <laughs> yeah. For, for the people who are, yeah. are thinking of visiting us here where we are in rural Italy, we always tell them you're going to need a rental car. And, and when we say Italy to them, they have in their head Milan and Rome. And mm -hmm. they go, really? I need a rental car? You don't have mass transit? And I say, we have a bus that comes by twice a day. I'm in the country. You're going to need a rental car. Like, I cannot explain this enough to people. So I like Larry's idea of trying to capture a little bit more about maybe preferred transportation modes or maybe any physical issues where they don't want to do a lot of walking or can't do a lot of walking or things like that. You know, how do we capture that, Larry? Is it okay to start someone's experience with, oh, I don't want to do an onboarding of like, Hi, what food do you like? And do you like museums? And can you walk a lot? Well, do you, do you start with that? You can start with some, <laughs> yeah, you can start with some basics, uh, such as 
capturing the whole travel itinerary of mm -hmm. okay you're leaving los angeles you're going to san Fran or uh to new york and you're getting there around uh you know rush hour um how do you you know does the user know how to get from the airport to downtown to the we Hilton talked about on that 54? one before right and so that's where the system again because it has all of this knowledge about the local um, transportation could suggest taking an Uber from the airport to the subway station, catching the red line that goes straight to um, the uh, the Hilton. You know, and so the user doesn't mm -hmm. have to know all this. And you know what? They're not going to find out unless they, you know, been to other cities where they have to rely on mm -hmm. different forms of transportation. So the system should be promoting this to the user based on local knowledge and that could be crowdsourced knowledge you know from people that have traveled there before and know this is how you do this and i'm just mm -hmm. smiling because i i happen to know that the red line in new york city will not does not go to the airport so in that case you would need to <laughs> you would need the blue yeah. the the e subway from queens to 53rd uh, to get to Larry's uh, fake hotel on 54th. Um, but yeah, a lot, you know, how <laughs> else are you going to know that other than calling me up or trying to open up Google Maps? And so, yeah, this is the type of thing that I think, it, Larry, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm playing newbie again. This is the kind of thing that knowledge design can address. Mm -hmm. We assume people do not know that the New York City airports are well outside of the city and you're going to have to figure out how to get into the city. Right, right. And there's no easy way unless you take a shuttle or a cab or something. But tell you what, a cab during rush hour, that's an interesting proposition. You don't want to Two do hours that. and $100 <laughs> later. Right. You know, thinking of um, when I was working with travel agency, they had some uh, physical agencies. So I think if you would like to have some information about what do people expect, maybe another way could also be to actually interview the people in the agency and ask them, how does it work? Like, what do people ask you? Like, you know, when you ask questions to the support people about what are users' main pain points? Well, if you think about the fact that some people go to an agency specifically for that, because they want all of those little details. They don't want to have to think about it. They want to go and say, I want to uh, go here. I want to go there. And uh, please find me the best stuff. You know, when you ask someone to book your holidays, that is basically what you do. You <laughs> give up, the, you give the, sh the grocery shopping list and they do that. So maybe it would be interesting also to get, uh, to know like what do people ask in physical agencies? Because there's a difference between a brochure, as you said, which is okay, I try to do something with that versus I am actually talking to a human being and I can ask questions. So I don't know if this would make sense as a source of knowledge. Yeah, that can be a good secondary source of knowledge. The travel agents mm -hmm. who, who deal with the customers and might have another angle on what some of their uh, concerns are or some of the things they were most disappointed by when they came back from a trip. But, you know, um, you could design this so that it acted like an agent. Um, it doesn't even have to have artificial intelligence in it, but you could set up mm -hmm. questions that ask people in stages, yeah. what are some of the things they need? So why are you going to New York City? Well, we want to see the new play that's opening up on uh, off Broadway. Um, how many people are going? Well, there's going to be four of us and we'll need, you know, uh, four rooms, well, would you want the rooms together? So, you know, it's just something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and you could use that to narrow down the information that you give back to the user, like, well, if there's four of you, you probably want to take a shuttle instead of a cab into town or something like that. You know, give suggestions. That's an example of how you use the mm -hmm. um, the objective of the user to identify what knowledge they need. You can't, well, see, you, you look at websites now and they have all the information you could ever want. You just don't know which of that information you need. <laughs> and then right. to put things like, you know, such and such uh, museum is 0.3 miles away, you know, in the details, people need to know that upfront, 
not after they've already, you know, looked at, you know, hotels. So the order in which you present information is important too. Don't wait till they've already opened it up and looked at the details of the hotel to tell them, oh yeah, this is 0.3 miles away. And oh yeah, there's no uh, mass transit nearby. You have to walk quite a ways. People need to know that ahead of time. I'm thinking about another it's angle worse. on knowledge. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, Steph, go ahead. Yeah, sometimes they, you get that information once you've booked, like, oh, you booked an hotel here. By the way, do you know there's this, this, this in the area? I was like, okay, that's cool to know. I'm happy, but maybe it would have been nice to know it before because uh, if there was something else, or maybe it could also help me choose which, which hotel I want or something like that. So, yeah, this happens in some kind of uh, journeys, but late, later. Yeah, and another thing I'm thinking, and, and and tell me what you both think of this, is what about knowledge design from the other perspective, which is we could ask people if they want close rooms or adjoining rooms, but I find that an aggregator site is not going to be connected into the hotel's inventory well enough to know if room 101 and 103 are available. You would have to probably not be an aggregator or travel mm -hmm. agent site. You would probably have to be the Hilton site to be able to tap into all of the hotel's inventory and say, aha, on our fourth floor, we do have three rooms next to each other or we do have something like that and and that that was just a note that i made is like that's a that to me that feels like a different angle of the knowledge design which is the knowledge of our own technical limitations and our own uh um, oh yes engineering capabilities <laughs> because i don't want to start designing a do you want close rooms or adjoining rooms if if the system is not going to know that did that make right, sense but if if, if you don't make it a requirement, the system will never have it. Right. So here's the thing. All of the websites copy each other now, right? They're all the same. They're all digital brochures. Even the, the brand name ones, you go to Hilton and they still mm -hmm. don't have connecting room selection. You don't have that. Well, if you had a website that did offer it, well, then everybody else would have to copy it and they would create the technology to be able to answer that question. Mm -hmm. So you have uh, usually to aggregators, uh, you, you can discuss with aggregators. We were using one specific aggregator and you could ask them for things, but then uh, it's kind of a third part provider oftentimes with the hotel. So technically, technically it was uh, super long if you wanted something uh, specific. So, but yeah, I agree sure, at some point, if no one asks start them, yeah, they, the API providers. If no one is asking them for that in the APA, they will not provide it. So it might take two years. And I'm really honest, like if you want something from the moment you decide you want it until you have it, it may take a lot of time. But uh, but this is also why um, if you look, especially in Germany, they use one specific aggregator everyone is using. And you basically have to design around their API, which is not always a good place to be as a designer, but it's also a reason why a lot of websites looks like each other because they can access only that amount of technology and data. So it's kind of a little bit sad. Yeah, I am lost. I'm trying the, to. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say that falls into the fallacy of, you know, uh, websites that only present the information they have without understanding what information the users really need and finding ways to provide it. Here and so take a look at what I've bumped goes into. beyond what you have. All if right, I have a I third that. guest, contact the hotel to book mm. an accessible room, select the room type first. Now I didn't ask for an accessible room. I, I'm just I just pretended we need three rooms because this is a Marriott website and I want to see if it asks me if I want the rooms close together. Let's say I want all three rooms to have spring break promotion. Let's say I like that one. Now I click select. <laughs> And it looks like it's in some sort of grayed out state, but I don't see what to do next. Do I have to go to the bottom of the page? No. I don't do even see what basket? to do next. Uh, you have a, a need, uh, you have a banner at the top room. What does edit. happen if you put edit? No, you edit your search, I think. Hmm. 
Yeah, and it looks like I can, I'm just going to select all of these. Look <laughs> at this. I'm taking every hotel room we've got. That's it. The whole hotel is mine. <laughs> what is even happening right now? The fact that you have photo coming soon is not really having me trust them on the, how up to date is this website. Yeah, it's hard because the, the hotels near me, like this hotel is, um, they tend to buy each other out a lot. Like it's a Sheraton and then it's a Marriott and then it's a Hilton and then they go and take new pictures. <laughs> but yeah, I'm stuck. I, I don't even know how to get past this select. So well, that, that's a whole nother problem. That is a whole other problem. That is not knowledge design, but I was mm. trying to see if I picked a place and then tried to book multiple rooms, would it, uh, you know, would it let me? Let's see, what, Sheraton El Conquistador in Tucson. I used to live near that. Is it still a Sheraton? No, it's back to Hilton. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, yeah, anyway, you two, you guys keep talking. I'm trying to see if anybody is going to ask me if I want my rooms near each other. I used to stay at the hotel next to that one in Tucson. What's next to it? Um, it's like the Holiday uh, Fairfield Inn? Inn, I think. Yeah. No, Fairfield Inn. Is that the one up um, in, on uh, Oro Valley? Yeah. yeah. Oh, look, this one says connecting rooms. Yay. Looking for connecting rooms? Make sure you've selected two or more rooms and you're booking at least three days in advance. Oh. You only have one room, I think, in your, at the top. Okay. Uh, okay, room, Here, one yeah. guest. One room, got one it. guest. Add room. I think you need to. Okay, got it. Update. Well, I'm pretending we're coming today, so it's a little bit late. Oh, and it's not three days in advance. You can't. You need three days. Yes. Okay, got it. <laughs> Anyway, that is interesting in that this did allow us to choose what? We tried. <laughs> All right, we tried. So this is broken every freaking where. Okay, I'm done. I'm done. Yeah. I'm done. Okay, so back to this article. Let's talk about some other things. It looks like we're not necessarily going to design today, but we are certainly going to talk about some of our approaches. Um, now we're talking about room features. Does it have a shower, a bathtub? Um, does it Yay. have, um, God in Italy, I have to check if things have air conditioning and if you can open the windows, sometimes you can't open the window when I'm just in there suffocating. Nope. Yeah. Larry, Steph, what's a good approach to, to some of the preferences people might have with respect to room amenities? You know, a lot of people don't know what, uh, options there are but if you could ask them questions again you could layer the questions so that you're not asking everything up front you can stagger them a little bit so you might ask them about mm -hmm. um you know do you uh you know things like their mobility do they have issues with mobility that might prevent them from getting into a bathtub for instance because you know there's a lot of hotels that have uh, bathtub showers and they may may need a more accessible shower. And then there are some hotels that all they have are pretty much showers, like the W hotels. And what if somebody wants a bathtub? So you mm -hmm. could ask a few questions to help narrow down what the options are. Um, Would it make sense to have smart defaults? Like if you identify the person is traveling for a uh, business, there's a pretty good chance they want Wi-Fi in the room. You know, they will not want an hotel that doesn't provide Wi-Fi or something like By that. By the way, I have so noticed right. that booking.com, if you, um, if we book some of our stuff from booking.com, hashtag not sponsored, and I've noticed there's this little checkbox here that says I'm traveling for mm. work. And what we have found that that seems to do, though, of course, it's not clear from here what that actually does or means, but I think it means you're going to get a room with a desk in it. Oh, uh, we're seeing your email address. You might want to close That's it. it. Now, everybody knows my email address. I'm not afraid of that. 
<laughs> Booking.com, I'm traveling for work. I wonder what it really does, but I've noticed I get rooms with desks. I think maybe you can have a different invoice than yours or something like that. Oh, that's interesting too. Right. You might have to book it to your your um, company your name. Your company name. Mm -mm. That's a good one too. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah, you know, and that's another interesting. Larry, is this another aspect of knowledge design that there was a checkbox there that says I'm traveling for work and I don't even know if it changes my search results or what <laughs> it does later? Is that good design or bad design? You know, you would... You would think that they'd have a way for you to find that information out. I mean, you you Googled it and you're getting some uh, feedback on that. But yeah, it, it's like if it's unfamiliar to people and um, and it doesn't suggest what they're going to get out of it, they might need to describe it a little bit. But it, that's along the lines of uh, doing some knowledge design, finding out from the user, yeah. you know, what their needs are. And if they're traveling for work, and there are things that you know, you know, apply to business travelers and you can kind of package that up. That's helpful, but it could at least say that. Right, because I yeah, do because tend to check you that off. Know. Yeah, now I check it off all the time because I found when I didn't check it off, we got rooms without desks. You know, we got like <laughs> bed, toilet, the end. And I was like, oh, holy cats, there isn't even a desk in here. I can't even like sit down and work. So that mm. that's what I noticed when I didn't check this. Now I just check it all the time. And and that would be an intelligent default. Like if I if I sign in, yeah. I would hope that booking would go. Debbie always looks for Debbie always checks off traveling for work. We should check it off by default. Larry, is that an intelligent default or is that over assuming? No, that'd be a, that's a perfect example of an intelligent default going by your previous behaviors and defaulting to say she always checks that so let's check it for her yeah. you could so, always uncheck it right so madalina is asking yes, do you see a price cost. difference do i see a price difference between work rooms so let's pretend that i'm traveling for work to the nearby poshi spot that i live near and let's see if we see a difference between what they recommend so here they recommend their top recommended hotels now, of course, we just looked at this one. This one had the first website where I selected <laughs> everything and never got a room. Um, these other ones, I don't know, but I'm sure my boyfriend will. That's what they're suggesting to me if I check off I'm traveling for work. Let's uncheck it and run the search again and see if they make different recommendations to me. No, but they did add mm -hmm. this banner saying, are you looking for a space of your own? Do you want an entire home or apartment to yourself? Uh, I think you had the checkbox on the homepage for that as well. Yes, I saw that. I did. Yeah. Um, and I can say. And but I think this is too. related to location. Yeah. Yeah, when I'm saying I'm traveling for work, it doesn't suggest the home or apartment. Do now, see, look at this. This says work friendly. Do you see this? Yeah. This says work friendly. It's got a pop up, so I don't know. It's got a mouse over state, so I don't know what that Desk. means to someone who is disabled and does not use a mouse, but it says free Wi Fi, desk or table to work at. Uh, essentials and invoice available upon request, which links back to what Stephanie was saying about how you might want to make mm. sure you are getting an, an invoice uh, when you leave. Um, so I'm, interesting. I'm worried about the pillows, though. Yes, why? Well, why? Well, I know that. See, sometimes <laughs> booking says things where it's like it's got pillows, and I'm like, oh yeah, I don't want to bring my own pillow. I didn't even know I had yeah, to look for that. I think that. that's supposed to be a laptop. No, but the, over here, Larry, it says Pillar, essentials, towels, tree. pillows, oh. linens, and toiletries. Like, oh, I'm going to get a pillow. Like, no, that's paper. basic stuff, you know. Right. <laughs> totally. So here's a bunch what? of ones that say, now here's the interesting thing. A bunch of the results on the page do say work friendly, but notice there isn't a yeah, filter. They didn't change, yeah. Well, they did, there isn't a filter. Work. Yeah, I think that's what you were talking about, was there isn't a filter where I can say, show me all the work-friendly ones. And they don't know auto-check anything for the filters, like I want Wi-Fi or something. Because right. you can make interesting assumptions as well. Well, mm. that's a good point. If I am looking for work-friendly, 
And if they seem to know here, like, let's take a look at this one. Free yeah, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi. desk or table. <laughs> so yeah. Number one. Mm. Yeah. So it's so interesting. They- Work friendly seems to be a package of things people tend to want. I would love to see it as a filter, but mm. it is not even a filter. So interesting. Well, Larry, what would I'd you like change know- here? Everything. Oh, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> oh, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the free Wi-Fi is a mm. you know, can mean a lot of things. Uh, I would want to know if it has business quality Wi-Fi. Mm. Because you know, I've been to some small hotels where they have um, DSL yeah. type Gosh. Wi-Fi. Or they went cheap and they got really good Wi-Fi, but they have 700 rooms. Right, exactly. Or how about the ones, Larry, I'm uh, sure you've been here. How about really good Wi-Fi, but you need a Cat5 cable and you need a, a really good inter- <laughs> it's really good internet, but not Wi-Fi, you need a cable. Yeah. Oh, man. And Martina asks, oh, yeah, Martina is asking, yeah. how could this pop-up be more accessible should it be a link. So, um, yeah, I mean, another problem with a page like this, which is if I imagine I don't have a mouse and I start tabbing through this, I am probably never gonna get there. Here's the t- here's me mm-hmm. tabbing. You can see based on the focus states where I am, it's tabbing through everything. Here, I might as well accept cookies. I do use this site from time to time. Yeah, that is not accessible. Yeah, imagine trying to, I mean, if I reload this page and I start from the beginning and I have to start tabbing my way through this, forget it. I mean, the first tab was skip to main (laughs) content as it's supposed to be. Yeah. And then now I'm tabbing, but look at that. The first tab was to X out this top thing. So it's really hard because I don't (laughs) think this site, yeah, I don't think this site has really invested in prioritizing accessibility, especially since I'm not even tabbing through the filters. So the people who have to go by tab, looks like they're not even going to get to use the filters. And notice Mm -hmm. the tab is skipping Wi-Fi friendly. Yeah, that's uh, uh, because it's not a link. Right, it's skipping work friendly because it's not a link. Yeah. It went from location 9.7 to see availability. So that's not even, yeah. that's not even there. And a screen reader will probably say work friendly to people, but they're not going to know what that means. So I, I would, I would say there's a lot of improvements that could be made here for accessibility. Oh, it depends oh. if it was coded properly, but uh, yes. I, I will not check question. the code. Yeah, right. Um, so here, go, go, back, ahead, go back to that page real quick. Sure. All right. So here's the thing. You're, you're looking for a hotel that has certain features based on your, you know, the answers you gave to the questions that your um, booking agent that we're, uh, we'll call it had asked you. And so this is tabbing to the names of these hotels. Right. What what are you going to do knowing the name of a hotel? What are you going to do differently? The name of the hotel is not the number one priority for identifying which hotel you want to go to. There are other factors you want to know, for instance, which hotel satisfies all of your needs, uh, which hotel is you know closest to the right place to stay for you know, going to see that Broadway show or going to that that restaurant. You don't care what the name is. Yeah. Uh, so that, you would it, make the name smaller or what's the suggestion here then? Um, there's a number of ways to approach this, but one might be uh, how representative or how close does a hotel match all of your requirements? That would be the first. Do we one. have a map? Um, yeah. Um, Maybe a map this? isn't all you need. Yeah, yeah no, there is clearly, a map. But, uh... Hmm. 
But then, yeah, you don't have your criteria. But here we didn't choose any filters or anything yet. Right. And also, it didn't even start me focused on the area I asked for, which was this area. It, mm. Notice it started me so <laughs> zoomed out that I was looking at stuff that was nowhere near. This was my original search area. These things are all over the place. That is so not I hate. I hate the fact that they show you stuff that is not avail available. I know why they do that because maybe you want to. Yeah, to that's change a checkbox uh, over here. Only show okay, available no. properties. So, but of course, if you, I mean, look how not accessible this is. We have we have this scrolling mm -hmm. panel, and then we have this scrolling panel. So much scrolling panel. Yay, we're in the area. We're <laughs> close. Oops, I accidentally clicked on it, and, and it always opens in a new window here. My question then would be, OK, let's imagine we go for uh, these questions, Larry, when we are going to ask them. Would you think it would be weird that the little thumbnail would change based on the, the criteria that we put? Because here it's pretty generic. If you click any filters on the left, you will still have the same thumbnail. But then if we say, OK, we might have some question at the beginning and then we would bring some hotel. Would it be strange from a user perspective? I wonder if those would adapt based on the information that we were looking for. Because it would go against oh, if, uh, if, consistency. You mean of like interface. Netflix? Uh, hmm. Not sure. More like uh, if I'm looking for certain criteria, maybe it would be nice to see them kind of a small recap of those criteria in the little thumbnail. Because here they say beachfront, but I, ah, yeah, you said beachfront. Okay. I chose beachfront. So they put it there. Yeah. And then it narrowed right. down the places. Now, if I say beachfront mm. and four stars, we've narrowed it down more. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I like the pictures there, but, um, you know, the criteria, like you said, could be off to the side so that you have a reminder of mm -hmm. what are the filters or the limitations or what are you really looking for? And then you can look at the pictures. You know, that's a nice transition. And the pictures, um, people like looking at pictures of uh, things that match their needs. Then they could look at it and say, oh, this one has a pool with a bar in the middle of it. That sounds like a lot of fun. I want to do that versus uh, mm. some place has, you know, cabanas on the beach. Um, so, you know, the pictures help, but it's not the primary selection mechanism. Yeah, I mean, ultimately people, you want people to look at your property and say, I want to do that. I want to be there. So how do you, how do yeah. you help people find that? Now, Sudoku asked a question saying, Larry mentioned layering the questions to users. When would you ask them a question or when would you make something a filter? Well, that's a good question. I don't always know the answer to that until I've done some research and understand what the task analysis is. Right. But you could layer it so that when they get down to the point of here are a lot of different places, then you can introduce more questions specific to the so list of hotels that came up, such as do they offer a shuttle service, you know, things like that. Would you want a shuttle service? You know, because some hotels are so far out of the center of a town that you would need a way to get back into town. And other uh, no. of these hotels might be right in the center of town, so you wouldn't need anything. So based on what the end result was, say you had a list of 10 hotels, you might have specific questions relative to that small list of hotels that wouldn't have come out in the initial uh, question and answer period. I have another knowledge design question. You know, as I'm checking off filters here on this site, there aren't, there they didn't put like chips up here. There isn't any way for me to see, mm -hmm. like, like I don't, so here's, here's something at the top. Now does this, are they claiming this matches all my filters? Some of my filters? 
I can see that there's a message under here saying, uh oh, there's no more mm -hmm. properties left in the town that I chose. Here are some that are nearby. I assume there are none left because of the filters that I put, but I don't have a sense of which things match my filters and how well. Right. So that's why I was saying earlier that you might have something that says matches uh, nine out of your 10 uh, you know, answers to the questions. Yeah, that's what and I was wondering can... because the, but... the beach front, so you, you got it in the that. thumbnail. I can yeah. take off beachfront and see what happens. Now we get lots of more hotels before we see no properties but, left. Yeah. But you still have it even if you didn't put it in a filter. Because I was wondering if the content of the thumbnail adapts to show the filter that you had inside the template directly. No, it doesn't look like it. And it looks like mm -hmm. each hotel maybe picked some of their selling points like, hey, we're 500 meters from the beach. Mm -hmm. And hey, so are we. <laughs> um, even though I didn't pick beachfront, it sounds like that's just a selling point. So this one is close to yeah. the beach and work friendly. And I guess this one is close to the beach and not work friendly. Depends on the sand. Yeah, right. <laughs> Do not put your laptop How in the sand. How much sun will you get? <laughs> uh, now, we are technically out of time. Sirocco, how did we do? Any last questions before we sign off? Sorry to, to run a few minutes late to Larry and uh, Steph, but if anybody has any last comments or questions, throw them at us now because uh, we are going to have to uh, sign off soon. I'll flip back to giant pictures of all of us. And uh, so as we see if there's any last questions, let's make sure everybody knows where to find Larry and Steph. Soroko says, amazing, thank you. Yes, I'm sorry we didn't get to designing anything, but hopefully the way that we looked at things and thought through things uh, will help everybody in some of their projects. Larry, how do we find you and stalk you? <laughs> uh, just look for me on LinkedIn. Uh... LinkedIn slash in slash Larry Marine. And Easy that's enough. where I spend most of my uh, social time. Very good. Steph, you've got many ways that we can find you and follow uh, you. Let's have the list. Yeah. Easiest is Stephanie Walter that design. And then at the bottom, there's a footer with all the stalking links. <laughs> Very yeah. good. Very it's good. Mostly yeah. Twitter and LinkedIn anyway. And of course, for my world, go to deltacx.com slash links, and you'll find all the links related to the show, like our calendar of events and how you can send thing in, things in for the Friday critical thinking stream and, and things like that. And of course, please do subscribe here on YouTube. And if you know a few people who are working on learning about UX, won't you please recommend them to this channel? We want to find, if we can find three more people, every day, three more people, and just have it keep okay. growing. Um, so uh, tomorrow is double office hours. I will be doing office hours at 10 a.m. Italy time and 6.30 p.m. Italy time with special guests, Darren. Darren and Dr. Nick, which you won't want to miss because evidently it's Darren's last show with us. He has a new job and will not be able to make the time for some future shows. So we're going to have to uh, start to find some rotating guests to replace Darren, even though there is no way to replace Darren. Yeah, um, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, we know he's irreplaceable, but he's got an exciting new job and he's, you know, our, our show falls in the middle of his day and it's hard for him to take the time. Uh, Wednesday, I will be talking about why I think Jared Spool is a gatekeeper and uh, which, of course, deserves this graphic. There we go. And um, uh, that'll be fun. Uh, Friday, of course, critical thinking stream. Uh, thank you, Miguel. Um, let's see, Monday, this again, if you have something you want to, uh, us to look at or me to look at for the Monday stream, something to research, design, or just kind of walk through, send it over. Go to deltaseax.com slash links and send it to the critical thinking stream. Uh, let's see, Tuesday the 22nd, AMA will be earlier. Wednesday the 23rd, based on some cool things Stephanie said to me, I'm going to do a show about 
publishing, publishing articles, publishing books, yeah. publishing courses, and some things <laughs> to do and some things to look out for. So again, just check the event calendar. Lots of good stuff coming up. So thanks again to Larry and Steph for joining. I know we'll see them soon in one way or another, uh, in front of the camera or in the chat room. And I'm going to play us out of here. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Customer centricity as business intelligence. Visit deltacx.com to learn why we are 